I've been discussing microservices for some years now. And then the, the two main questions that I always received when I was talking about that with different teams worldwide was that first, how do I break my monolith? And second one, how do I deal with my data? So I'm focused on researching a lot on the subject of how do I split and how later, how do I integrate my data into my microservice architecture. So that's, that's what we're going to discuss. My name is Edson Yanaga. As I said, I'm a Brazilian Japanese. My grandparents are, are Japanese but I was born and raised so far in Brazil. Uh, currently, I'm a director of developer experience at Red Hat. And just in case you want to follow me, my Twitter handle is at Yanaga. I talk a lot about DevOps, microservices, Java, domain-driven design, uh, and all of this kind of related stuff. I also happen to be a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP, which is kind of a weird combination. But you know, it just shows to us that the world has changed a lot, and I work for Red Hat. Yeah, how cool is that? Uh, but in the end, it just means that uh, open source has won. So that's why I'm very happy to be here to showing that to you. Because, uh, well, I'm a, a Java champion, and Microsoft granted me the MVP because uh, I worked with the product managers uh, uh, at Redmond to build up the Java support on the, on the uh, Azure platform because I believe that we as Java developers, we value very lot, uh, uh, a lot the options that we have in the platform. So it's very important for us to be able to run our Java applications in many different cloud computing providers. So that's why I help with them. And uh, it's very, I would like you to give you a tip. Uh, I've just released this book from O'Reilly, Migrating to Microservice Databases. Uh, it's available for free in the Red Hat Developer site. If you, if you registered, uh, you can download the book for free in this full URL, but just in case you don't want to type everything, you can just go to developers.redhat.com slash books. You get a list of the, all the free books that we have available for download. And today, here at JBCN Conf at 4.15 PM, uh, I have a few, I think I have 50 hard copies available. I'll do a book signing. So just in case you want a hard copy of the book, I'll be more than happy to sign it for you uh, at 4.15 PM at the Red Hat booth, OK? And I always like to start my sessions with this quote from Forbes. Now every company is a software company. I, I like to say that you don't work for a bank. You work for a software company. You don't work for an industry. You work for a software company because software is changing the world. And some people call this new thing like digital transformation or this new digital economy. I'm used to be one of these people that used to think that economy had everything to do about money. But after reading some books, particularly behavior uh, economic, uh, economics book, I just learned that uh, economics has nothing to do with money, but has everything to do about, about people. Because economics basically it studies how people interact with each other and they, how they change uh, a, a system from one state to the other. And they have some motivations from changing one state to the other. Some of these motivations can be love, can be hate, can be power, and can be money too. So we're talking basically about how people interact with each other because software is made by people. For people, every time we forget that, we have a non-optimal result. That's why it's so important for us to, to remember that we essentially we are dealing with people. And some great examples of this new digital economy is that the largest car transportation company in the world owns no cars, which is Uber, which unfortunately you don't have here in Barcelona. And also the largest lodging company in the world owns no real estate, which is Airbnb. The largest online retailer in the world owns no stock, which is Alibaba. And the largest content network in the world produces no content, which is Facebook. All of these companies that have something in common is that they only exist because of software. So software is changing the world. Software can change the world for the better. And I think that we as developers, we are here because we know that we can change people's lives. And if we were able to make a decision, I know that we can make people miserable with the software that we produce, but also we can produce wonderful things that can change people's lives for the better. If we can make a decision, I think that's the decision that we should be doing. Okay, I know that uh, maybe tomorrow or Wednesday, Sandro Mancuso will be here. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, probably about software craftsmanship. I consider myself also a software craftsman, and the best definition that I have of a software craftsman is somebody who cares about he what, what he or she is doing. So if you're all here trying to learn some things, start trying to uncover better ways of doing the things that we're doing every day, then I believe that we all care and we can all be considered software craftsmen. We are all trying to improve what we do and what we deliver every day into production. 
And if uh, we're talking about DevOps and microservices these days, I think if I had to choose just one topic to talk about DevOps and microservices, I would say that the most important thing is the feedback loop. Because if you think about all of the major revolutions or evolutions that we had in the software development process in the past like 40 years, they all try to solve or try to improve the feedback loop that we have. For example, uh, we as humans, we need a feedback loop to, to, to ask us if we're doing the right thing right. And the faster and the shorter and the better feedback loop that we have, the better the software that we, live, uh, th that we deliver that into production. But just to give you a technical term, uh, the most important uh, technical term that you can have in the DevOps and microservices world, we call that the batch size. And the batch size, technically, is the amount of changes that you, uh, that you release into production into each one of your releases. So if you're changing a lot of things, you have a huge batch size. If you have a you change small, uh, small things, then you have a small batch size. And how, do you, uh, how does that influence that? If you think about that, what prevents you from delivering software faster into production? Usually the number one answer that I have for that is bugs. But people think, well, if we have too many bugs when we release software to production, maybe then we need more time for testing. Okay, if we release software every month, now we need two months to release software to production. But then they realize that if you have more time to test, you also have more time to, go to code. And when you release uh, every two months, you have even more bugs than you had before. So people think about th that's the normal way of thinking because we, if, we, if, it's, if it's painful for us to release software into production, uh, then we try to avoid that to the maximum uh, amount of as possible. So if we release every two months, we're, we're releasing like four months. If we release in six months, that's one year. Then we're releasing software every anniversary. I thought it wouldn't be possible to have a, a release cycle a larger than one year. But then I visited a customer uh, this year and they told me that the only, well, it's a, it's a uh, government, it's, a, for the, uh, it's a, a company that releases software to the public sector, so they only release a, software, uh, a new version every four years. Because, I don't know, it, uh, sometimes it has the same time frame as the elections in the country, so you can see a pattern. Okay, but the four years, it's too much, and realize they have a lot of bugs, because they told me that the coding is already done, and they're going to spend the next two years integrating the software. Okay. I don't know if that's an excuse or if that's real. But then you realize, uh, if you think about, let's try to solve this problem. The DevOps way of solving this problem, bugs into production, is that I'll start to create a very simple correlation for that. What causes bugs into production? Okay, We say that, uh, technically, we say that changes in the releases causes bugs into production. Where do we have these changes? Usually we have these changes in code, in data, in environment two. So let's try to simplify even more to establish a correlation. I'll say to you that what causes bugs into productions are changes in code. So the more changes in code you have, the more bugs you have into production. So the economical way to solve this problem is the less changes you have in your code into each, into each one of your releases, the less bugs you have into production. That's why we always try to aim in the DevOps and microservices world. That's why we're always trying to aim for to reduce our batch size and again, just to give you uh, some technical terms, the smaller the batch size that you have in your process, the smaller is also the lead time, which is the amount from I idea to production, and the smaller also is your release cycle, which is the time between each one of your releases. So if you improve your batch size, in fact, you're improving a lot of different measures in your software development process, right? But if you try to improve your batch size to the smallest possible amounts, which will, the, the ideal size would be one commit, one release into production, even if you try to reduce that, there will be a moment in your software development process where we will not be allowed to reduce it further. Why is that? Because we have something called a maintenance window, which is a specifically time frame in the month or the week that the ops guys tell you, well, you're only allowed to update your software into production like every Saturday a night, 3 a.m., or every third Saturday of the month, 3 a.m., because you're not allowed to disrupt user into production. So, but if you want to further release the, the, the bad size, we need to break this maintenance window. We need to be able to, to deploy our software into production more often. So for that, we, ne we need to have zero downtime deployments. And for that, the, symbol, the, the single uh, requirement that we need for being able to deploy that into production with zero downtime is that we need at least blue-green deployments. And I'll try to explain to you very quickly what is a blue-green deployment, basically, 
In a traditional architecture, you have your clients issuing requests to your deployment, which I'll call that a blue deployment. If you want to create a zero downtime architecture, then you need to add another component to your architecture, which is usually a proxy. It can be a reverse proxy, it can be a load balancer, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that you're adding another component which receives the request on behalf of the deployments and just forward the request to the backend. Then if you want blue-green deployments, I'm going to create two equal environments, a blue and green. Each one of them is capable of handling 100% of my requests in production at a given moment. So it's not a load balancing strategy, it's just more like a, a failover strategy. I have two separate environments with equal capacity. And if I want to do a blue-green deployment, then maybe first I'll ask the router or the proxy to stop issuing requests to the green deployment. Then it's going to, I'm going to stop the green servers, I'm going to copy the new artifacts, I'm going to, to start the, the green servers, and then maybe I'm going to issue some fake requests just to warm up if you're used to Java. Maybe you need to warm up your, uh, your JVM. Then when everything's okay, when everything's replying very fast, I can do that and uh, ask the router to start issuing requests to the green deployment and repeat the process to the blue deployment. Okay, that's the basic of the blue-green deployment. And blue-green deployment allows you not only to, uh, to create zero downtime deployments, but it's also it's the safest way to you to release software into production because at a given moment, if anything went wrong to the green deployment, you always have the previous version working as the blue deployment. You just need to ask your router to stop issuing requests to the green deployment and you issue them to the blue deployment back. So it's a very fast rollback strategy too. Then maybe if you do the same, you stop the blue servers, you copy the new artifacts, you start, you warm them up. When everything's okay, you can ask the router to issue requests to the blue deployment too. And maybe then in this situation, you can even load balancing between them and not just fail over. So this is the basics of blue-green deployment. And you just might be wondering, is that so easy? I would say that, well, yeah, no matter how hard uh, you have, uh, uh, in your code, I'm saying that um, even if your code is very hard to craft, code is always easier than data. So I like to say that code is easy, but state is very hard, right? State is always the hardest part of your application. And when we're talking about zero downtime deployments, we have two different kinds of states. You have ephemeral state, which is the state that you usually store in the sessions. And, and in some applications, you just allow it to lose the state because the user will have to log back again back in again, or maybe feel some form that he, he or she was, was feeling, but that's the, the worst case scenario where we have a, 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 a ephemeral state. But when we're dealing with persistent state, usually with this, uh, which is the state that we're storing in a relation database, that is very hard. How do we have zero downtime deployments with persistent states ju just as relational database? So that's the, the question that I'm trying to answer. How do I create zero downtime deployments using relational databases? Well, the first step is that you need to automate everything. You're not allowed to be issuing SQL scripts manually uh, again to your database. You're not allowed to issue, create your SQL statement and to create a JIRA or email that to your DBA to be applied during the, 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 the software upgrade process. You need to automate everything. That's uh, two of the most popular tools, not just in the Java world, but in general. Our Flyway and Liquibase, as, uh, as of this year, both um, both tools, I believe, are feature complete. They all solve the same problem. I just have a, uh, I just prefer Flyway because that's the u the tool I've been using the past few years. But uh, I know that both are good tools and both do both solve the same problems because they can automate your migrations. You can apply both of the tools inside your process, inside your Java application. Uh, when you bootstrap your application, they can automatically detect the version on your database and apply the migrations. Or else you can do that during your deployment process, which is my favorite strategy, but again, both works. It's up to you to choose which strategy uh, works better for you. Then, uh, for us to have zero downtime deployments with relational databases, we need zero downtime migrations. And migrations, technically, is the amount of things that the, is the amount of code and SQL statement that you apply in your database to change your database schema state from one state to the other. That's technically the, the term for migrations. And the answer for that, if we want to do zero downtime deployments with relation to databases, our uh, migrations must be back and forward compatible. And to achieve that, we need to break. We're not allowed to have like 100 SQL statements anymore in our migrations. We need to provide baby steps. And for that, we need the smallest possible batch size. So for many cases, it means that instead of have 100 
we have only one single statement, SQL statement per migration, okay, per release of software. Another thing that we have to take care of is that if we have, if we issue like an update statement to our database and we have like a billion rows in our database, then it's going to take a long time for this update statement to be completed. And while it's running, you have lock time. Lock time in your database also means downtime because users are, are not allowed to modify the information that you have in your application. So you need to avoid that. And uh, the answer for that is you need to shard your updates. And shard, okay, is a technical term in the database world to say that you need to split your update statement into many smaller statements. So each one, if you have a billion, maybe you need to update your rows like a million at a time. So you have very small lock times. And, and, the, um, and the bearable amount of lock time that you are allowed to have in your application really depends on your application. So I always suggest you to, to rehearse a lot of your migrations into your um, test environment before trying to apply that into production, okay? So what happens? Then maybe if we're used to, to create a statement like this, alter table, customers rename columns something to something else, then maybe I have to change this uh, migration to, instead of having just one statement, to have a lot of different statements. Maybe I'll uh, need to add first add a column, then the update the, col the, the values, then finally delete the column, okay? So I've been uh, talking about and discussing this subject with a lot of different teams worldwide. And I was able to collect most of the uh, migration that these teams are using into production these days. And I was able to collect, like, th there are four basic scenarios that uh, people are using in production to do zero downtime migrations, which are basically add a column, rename a column, change the type and format of a column, or else delete a column. And if you think about that, well, you're not talking about tables. But if you think about t as a, a table, as a collection of columns, then you can easily just apply multiple times these scenarios that and strategies that I'm going to show you to modify your tables and everything else. So I'll pass very quickly through these this scenarios for you. If you want to check that in more detail, you can uh, read my book while well, well, I detail these strategies. So first scenario is add a column. If you want to add a column you know, to add a table into production, you won't be just outer table, add column first. Each one of w these numbers, one, two, three, and four, is going to be a different release of your software, a different version. And each one of these statements is going to be uh, automated with your database migration too, okay? So the first version, version, you add a column. The second version, your code computes the read value and writes to the new column. When the same computes the new read value, maybe you can have a default value or maybe your data can be extracted and calculated from other columns in your system. Uh, then. Third version, you're, you update your data using shards. And of course, if you have um, uh, too many rows, maybe you, can, you need to issue like multiple update statements, each one in a different release. And fourth, code reads and writes from the new column. Okay, that's the basic steps. And I have to tell you, between each one of these releases, you, be, you have to open your, your, your uh, SQL CLI and issue some select statement to check if the data that is written on your database is correct. So the, uh, I like to say that zero downtime migrations are not only the only way to do zero downtime migrations into production, but also it's the safest way to do to apply any migration. Because the secret sauce here is that all of the migrations that we're applying to production are non-destructive. You never lose any data, and you can always roll back your application to the previous version because it will always work with the data that is already in the database. So if you release a new version, and your new version is, ri is writing the wrong data to your database, you can check that, oh my god, then you can easily roll back and everything will be working fine because you never lose any data when applying these zero non-time migrations, okay? Then next scenario is rename a column. Then this is the most complicated one. If you want to rename a column, First step, you add a column. Your second step, your code reads from the old column and writes to both because you need your data in your previous version too. Uh, third, third step, you copy your data using small shards. You issue multi multiple update statements. Uh, fourth step, your code reads from the new column and writes to both. Fifth step, your code reads and writes from the new column. And sixth step, uh, you delete the old column, but you don't do that in a, sub in a sequential release. You just mark that column for deletion. And then maybe your, data, uh, your DBA in your maintenance window will, well, we're not using this column for like three weeks. It's safe for us to delete this column now because nobody's using it, that anymore. And you only delete the column uh, very later 
because deleting a column is a destructive statement, and you don't want to do that in produ the production, okay? And uh, next scenario is the change the type and format of a column. And if you see, you have a pattern here. Have rename a column, change type of a column. That's exactly the same steps, which is a good thing because you, you're able to be rehearsing always the same steps when you're trying to apply zero the time migrations. And the last scenario is try to delete a column, which basically I have to tell you, don't. You never delete a column into production because that's a destructive statement. You just... If you want to really want to delete the column, you don't. You just stop using the the, the read value, but you keep writing the, the the value to the database because you might need that for the previous version. Okay, then maybe uh, later you can release a new version which doesn't write to the database anymore, and you can mark that for deletion. But that's usually like three weeks later. It really depends on your release cycle, and really depends on how often you have your maintenance window. Okay. Another question is, what do I do with my referential integrity constraints? Uh, there is no easy answer for that. Uh, you have to drop them and recreate all the constraints when the migrations are done. Because I know, uh, if you think about that, you don't need these constraints for your application to work properly. They are just a safety net. I know that I'm suggesting you to drop your safety net exactly when things can go wrong. But sometimes you have to break some walls to make room for improvement. And that's exactly the case. And the same applies for like not no constraints. If you have not no constraints, you're only allowed to apply them after you have all of the migrations uh, finished. Okay? So that's what I deal with uh, zero done time migrations. And you might be wondering why I'm talking about zero done time migrations in the context of uh, microservice architectures. Because downtime means that if you had a uh, monolith, the downtime of your monolith uh, meant the downtime of your application. But if you have a distributed system where you have multiple moving parts, the downtime of your application is the downtime uh, of your individual components multiplied by each one of them. So you're not allowed to have like, my whole system will go down because one of my microservices is going updated, is getting updated into production, okay? So you know, you're not allowed to have like, uh, downtime because of your, uh, your database migrations. So all of your, the, you, you need to, to prepare, of course, for, for uh, for fails and everything else, but you need to improve the availability of your individual components so you can have a good overall availability too. That's why I'm discussing zero downtime migrations with relational databases. And these strategies, they can be certainly modified and applied to other kind of databases too. But I'm just discussing relational databases because if you're developing enterprise software, and we believe that like more than 90% of the uh, software developers in the world, they develop enterprise software, so that's the problem that I'm trying to solve here, okay? So now we will start to discuss some microservices characteristics. And Martin Fowler did a nice job trying to collect nine of them. And today I'm just going to discuss this one, the centralized data management, because usually that's the one that uh, uh, people have more doubts about that. Because the centralized data management means that each microservice must own its own database, okay? but this data that is inside the microservice, it needs to be consumed in other microservices and in your old monolith too. How do I deal with that? Okay. So the first question is how do I extract my microservice database? That's a very common question too. Unfortunately, today I won't give you the answer because I believe that the answer goes through proper domain model. So I have a, another talk and another, um, I'm, I'm writing another book about the subject how can you can use some strategies to model your domain model properly to be able to extract that later. But today I'm going to show you how can you, if you decided which piece of your database to extract, I can show you how you can successfully integrate that into a microservice architecture, okay? So if you have this pattern of one database per microservice, but if the best practice is to have like this old legacy monolithic application with an old legacy monolithic relational database, uh, if I have that, I have a monolithic application talking to a monolithic database. How do I split that and how do I integrate them later? Well, basically it means that for a certain amount of time, both your monolith and your microservice will be needing to read and write from the same data store. Okay, but splitting, uh, of course, it's not easy, it's hard. Uh, and the question is, how do I integrate that? Imagine that I have a monolith and I decided that I want to extract the customer information from my monolith. Okay, so I create a customer microservice, but the monolith still needs the customer information. How do I integrate this data later? Because many people think 
that uh, I want to create a microservice architecture. I just extract the customer information and I create a customer microservice. Then, okay, I had a customer DAO here. Instead of uh, queuing uh, the, the database directly, I just create, well, I'll create a REST endpoint here and this customer DAO now it's gonna issue HTTP request and it's gonna return that and I'm gonna uh, solve this problem. Well, when they, they release that into production, they realize, oh my God, it doesn't scale. Okay, they realize we need a cache. They start with an internal cache in the monolith. But my cache is not big enough. Then they realize, well, we need an external cache. Then they have, to have another service for caching the customer information because or else it's too low, it's too slow. Then we realize, well, now we have cache. But now I used to have uh, like a hundred different reports in my old monolith, and I just had to use a join to have the customer information collected together with the rest of information that I needed. Then we realized, now I'm doing, I used to do a SQL with a join with a customer table. Now I need to do the join in memory because I have data from the databases, uh, database tables, and now I have information from my cache. Then they realize it's too much work. And the last step is always, why don't I create a CQRS architecture with my database? That's the discussion that I'm going to show you right now. But before that, I need to introduce some basic aspects about consistency models. I know if you ever studied uh, distributed systems, it's a very complicated subject. So I'll try to oversimplify that because for our use cases, enterprise systems, we basically only use two different consistency models, which is um, strong consistency and eventual consistency. And I'll try to simplify even further. I'll give you an example. Strong consistency means that if we have multiple nodes in my system, uh, all of the nodes must agree with a new value before the value can be uh, read by any client. So if I have a distributed system, if I say that in this node i equals to 5, yes, everybody in the system needs to agree, okay, an i equals to 5 before anybody can read the, the value 5, okay? This is a strong consistency, and usually this is the consistency model that we can achieve like using distributed transactions, right? But then you realize that you have eventual consistency. And I'm going to talk about with you, which is uh, a, a very specific model of eventual consistency, which is a strong eventual consistency. Because with pure eventual consistency, we can have conflicts. But in an enterprise system, usually it's not the case. Because in an enterprise system, usually you choose one node to be the canonical source of information. So if I say that this is the customer microservice, this is the customer node, the only node in the system that is allowed to change the customer information is the customer microservice, okay? So this is a strong consistency, the strong eventual consistency model. And I say that um, all of the nodes of the, of the systems, uh, when I say e i equals to five, uh, the other nodes in the system, they can have different values, but their values, they are always correct, but they might be outdated. So if I say i equals to five in everybody, then I update that i equals to seven. Then some clients might still have the five value and sometimes might still have the seven value. Oh, or, or an even older value. And my sometimes must be, uh, some nodes can be updated already. So in a strong eventual consistency model, the values are always right. It just means that they might be a bit outdated. And if you think about that, we already live in a, in a strong eventual consistency world because if you query your system for some information and you show that on a web page, you're not seeing current information. You've seen the information that was like some milliseconds ago or some seconds ago. So we are already dealing with strong eventual consistency. We're just not used to think about that, okay? But we have to explore more about that because if we're dealing with uh, distributed systems such as microservice architecture, we need to use much more this, this model of strong eventual consistency, okay? I also have to discuss with you what is CRUD and what is CQRS. Now CRUD, I think everybody knows what is it. But uh, with CQRS, many people have some mis misconceptions and I'll try to ex explain to you in a very simple way too, what is that? If you have a CRUD architecture, which is the simplest possible one, and also it's the, re the one that we recommend for the simple scenarios, we believe that like 80% of the cases can be successfully solved with uh, CRUD architecture, which means that for the create, read, update, and delete operations, we always use the same model. When I say the same model, I'm using the same model, I'm using the same Java class for all the read and write operations, and I'm using the same data store, the same set of tables and columns in my database for the read and write operations. This is CRUD. And what is CQRS? 
CQRS means Command and Query Responsibility Segregation, which is a very fancy name for saying that, well, we might have different models for reading and writing. What does that mean? It means that maybe I have a customer class which I use for the write operations, but if I want to read the, 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 the customer information from my database, then maybe, uh, well, the customer has a lot of things, uh, has a lot of uh, columns. It has the address, the address history, it has the phone numbers, it has the, the credit history, it has, a, it has the transactions, it has a lot of different things, but I want to generate a customer report. And for the customer reports, the only relevant information for me is the customer name and the customer email. So you don't want to retrieve all of the information from all of the customers to just print the customer name and the customer email on your, in your, in your page, on your, your screen. So what do you do? You create what we call a DTO. You create a customer DTO, which only holds the customer name and the customer email for that. And when I'm saying DTO, I'm not talking about this old uh, EJB one point something DTO. I'm talking about DTO as, uh, uh, as um, placeholders for information. So these are basically classes they, ha they have no behavior. They just contain some data. So when you create a customer DTO to queue information from your database, you are creating a CQRS model, okay? So CQRS just means that you have different set of classes for writing and different classes, uh, different set of classes for reading. So if you have a customer and a customer DTO, you're already creating a CQRS architecture. So many of us have been creating CQRS architectures for many years. We just didn't know that it had this name. Then you realize uh, if you're using different classes in your in memory to, to map the write operations and the read operation, what prevents you from reading this information from different set of, uh, sets of tables and columns? So a very interesting scenario of CQRS is when you have CQRS architectures with different data stores. Maybe you're writing the information to one set of tables and you're reading the information from another set of tables. How can I do that? If you ever use the, the database materialized view or view in your database, just to, well, I use the, this report that does a lot of the aggregation. Maybe I need to create a materialized view to query that faster. You are creating a CQRS architecture. So you've all been doing that. You just didn't know that it had this name. If you ever use it, uh, BI2, like ClickView or um, Pentaho or something, uh, which extracts the information and writes to the database to generate reports, that's a CQRS architecture too. Most of us just didn't know that it had this name. So that's basically CQRS. And if I'm discussing CQRS, I also have to discuss event sourcing. And beware of that many people that are discussing microservices, they are advocating that, well, event sourcing is the answer for everything in a distributed architecture. And I have to tell, be very cautious about that because event sourcing is very hard to be done properly. So I've seen people trying to use event sourcing without experience and in the end they have like a distributed mess because you have a very uh, tight coupling between your, your services, which is even worse than having like a, a, a monolith without that. So, but what is CQRS and what is event sourcing? You don't need to apply this concept in your architecture, but usually if you have an event sourcing architecture, uh, CQRS is a very common solution to some of the problems that you might have in an in a event sourcing architecture. And how does it work? I'll give you the classical example of a bank account. So if you think about the bank account, uh, 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 the money, and you, have, you add some uh, transactions, so event sourcing means that the state of information is not a column in inside a table. It means that the in event sourcing, the state of information, the canonical source of information in a, is a stream of events. So in a bank account, the amount of money that you have in a bank account means that if all the bank accounts start with a zero amount of money, the amount of money that you have in your bank account is like the debit and credit transactions that you have in your history. So at any given moment, if you want to know how much money do I have, you just have to successfully apply all the debit and credit operations until you have the current amount, okay? But then you realize, I can't do that because the more transactions that I have and the more accounts that I have, the slower it gets. So I'll, have a, I'll take a lot, a lot of time to, to compute how much money each one of the accounts they have. So you see event sourcing, usually for read uh, operations, it doesn't perform very well, but for write operations, it's very fast. Then you create a CQRS architecture with that. You create another table and another column, and you just store the cached amount of money that you have, okay? And what do you get? 
you get auditing for free because you write transactions here in the log, but you read the amount of money that you have here in the CQRS, but the true source of information are the transactions because at any given moment, you can start from zero, apply all of the operations and check if the cash uh, uh, value is correct or not, okay? This is a typical scenario of event sourcing and a CQRS data store. That's why usually people tie event sourcing with CQRS, right? So given that, I want to discuss then how can I integrate my microservice and my monolith data into a microservice architecture. So I've collected some strategies that people are using successfully into production to integrate this kind of information. And I was able to collect nine different strategies that teams are using worldwide, which are shared tables, database view, the database materialized view, triggers, transactional code, ETL, data virtualization, event sourcing, and change data capture. And I have a nice, cool demo in the end. I want to show you using change data, data, data capture. So the first one are shared tables, which means both your monolith and your microservice are reading things from the same set of tables and columns in a shared database. Uh, it's the fastest data integration. You have strong consistency because you're always using database transactions, but it has very serious problems such as low cohesion and high coupling. In fact, this is such a bad strategy, which means that if you're reading and writing from the same tables and you have different teams writing your monolith and your microservice, basically means that you will never be able to change anything anymore because if you change here, you have to change there too. And one team doesn't communicate to the other, it just prevents everything. If you do that, you'll be doing that to the end of your life because it will be very hard to coordinate the changes between these different teams. In fact, I consider this to be a hack. Uh, if you know what you're doing and you say, wow, we ju let's just release that in production, but we know that we have to fix that in the next release because it's gonna be a huge problem if we don't, then you can do it or else just don't, okay? So another integration strategy is that you create a database view. Maybe you have the customer microservice here with the customer information, but your old monolith, you can create a, data, uh, a database view with the customer information you, so you can still use the joins that you have here for your reports and you have uh, uh, the data available. How do you create, well, so you can use a database view. It's the easiest one to implement. It has the largest support from the BMS vendors because as of this year, even embedded database like A2 or SQLite, they have support for views. Uh, you might have possible performance issues depending on your, your DBMS and depending on how you create your uh, view query. Uh, it has a strong consistency because you're always issuing transactions to the same database. One database must be breachable by the other, which means that um, uh, if you're talking about Oracle, you need to create a DB link, and I know that some DBAs are gonna curse me for that. But I know, I've seen people using that, and sometimes it works. I even did that myself a couple of times. And it's updatable depending on the BMS port, and again, I know that at least on Oracle, uh, you can create updatable views, even though I don't recommend that, okay? Database materialized views, uh, most of the, um, um, uh, of the database that where you can create a view, uh, at least the most enterprise grade database available, you can also create a database materialized view. Materialized views, they offer better performance because you're reading and writing from physical tables. Uh, uh, you ha can have stronger eventual consistency, depends if you update your materialized view on commit or uh, on trigger or on, uh, on, on, on a timer trigger or on demand. So it really depends on that. W again, one deb database must be reachable by the other. Again, on Oracle, it, it means a DB link. Again, people curse me for that, but I've done that before and sometimes it works. Uh, you, you just have uh, like a, a huge latency for that. It doesn't work very well with on commit uh, updates, but for, for timer triggers or for on demand, it works pretty well. Okay, and again, it's updatable depending on the BMS port. I know it works on Oracle. You can also create uh, database triggers, which again depends on DBMS support. It always has strong consistency because you can generate the trigger uh, when you're committing, you're updating something. And again, one database must be breached by the other, but this strategy it, it has the same problems because database triggers, it has uh, cohesion issues and also has scalability issues. Because you have to code, I have a customer database and I'm integrated to my monolith. It works when, because uh, this kind of integration is point to point. It works well when you have only one endpoint. But then you realize you create uh, uh, your microservice architecture with lots of microservices. And most of them, they need the, the customer information. So then you 
implies that you need to start coding the trigger, the update uh, code. So if you update a, a customer, you have to update here, 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 and that. It doesn't scale. It doesn't work if you do that like uh, on every single commit. So database triggers, it works. It, it can be considered a, a bad practice, but it works if you have like just a single endpoint in because it's a point-to-point -point integration. You can use transactional code here, and when the same transactional code uh, can be stored procedures or distributed transactions, doesn't matter. You have strong consistency because you're using uh, transactions. Again, you have possible cohesion and coupling issues, performance issues too, because again, it's point-to-point -point integration, it doesn't scale, uh, and it's updatable depending on how it is implemented. I don't recommend that, but you can do. Uh, another uh, possible integration is ETL tools like ClickView or Pentaho. Uh, you have lots of available tools. Maybe that's the most the category where we have the most tools. Requires an external trigger, which is usually time based or on demand. You click the button for that. Can aggregate from multiple data sources. It's all eventual consistent because by the time you read information, it's already outdated. And uh, it's a read-only integration because it's not supposed to be bidirectional. Okay. I suggest ETL tools if you already have an ETL team in, in, in your company and you, people are used to using like ClickView or Pentaho for extracting information, then it's just another integration that you have to perform yeah? because people are used to that. This one is one of my favorites, data virtualization. One of the benefits that uh, data virtualization, you just create a virtual database on top of your physical database. And uh, since you're it's a virtual database, you're still reading and writing from the same set of physical tables underneath. It has a strong consistency because you have transactionals. You can, again, you can aggregate from multiple data sources, and it can be updatable depending on the solution that you choose. I want to show you this picture. Of course, I don't want you to read the things because it's very small. I just want to show that, that you can create, you can have multiple different sources from here. You can create your, uh, uh, you can have your virtualization layer where you can create multiple virtual databases, and then you can you have your applications consuming that. And data virtualization is a very safe strategy. In fact, I believe that's the safest possible integration scenario for microservices, because since you never change your physical database, if you want to start playing with microservices, because one of the biggest mistakes that people uh, have when dealing with microservice database is, well, I decide to split this set of tables into my microservice. Oh my god, I did it wrong. Now I have a hu real, huge mess. How do I put them back? Well, you have a huge uh, problem trying to do that. But if you're using virtual database, you just create your physical database, your monolith can still be using the same uh, physical assets, and you create a virtual microservice with a virtual database. And you just play with the data, and then you create your virtual, uh, your microservice which you're, you're using your virtual database. And if you check that, and if after some months everything is working properly, then you can decide to split that physically. So you can always, oh, if, uh, if things go wrong, you just dispose your virtual database and start from zero again. That's why I believe it's also the safest. Also, you can use event sourcing, which means that state of data is stream of events. It eases auditing. It's event consistency because uh, you, you usually you, ha you have to distribute the message through a message broker. Uh, uh, since you use a message broker, it's highly scalable. But the problem with event sourcing is that if your application wasn't modeled as a stream of events, then you have to change the, the old legacy code to, to fit for a stream of events. And it's very, very hard. So I don't suggest, if you're doing something new, then maybe it's, it's good for you to create an event sourcing architecture. But if you're dealing with legacy code, you really don't want to mess with your legacy code base in your legacy database just to apply for event sourcing. Okay? Then I have to show you my one o another of my favorite strategies is change data capture, and this is the last one. Uh, you can your read data source that you create using CQRS is updated through a stream of events. Okay, it's eventual consistency because you have to propagate the message through a message bus, and it's highly scalable too. And just in case you're wondering, I want to show you a very cool uh, CDC tool, which is Debezium, which is uh, an open source project sponsored by Red Hat. As of this time. Debezium supports out of box MySQL, Postgre, MongoDB, and we have uh, Oracle support is already, but it's uh, it's not uh, final. And they were we will be working on SQL Server too. I want to show very quickly how it works. So I have this demo already running here. So here, what do I have? I have uh, I have a Zookeeper running, which is a dependency for Kafka. 
And here I have a Kafka bus running. Kafka is a very interesting tool, uh, which is an open source tool, which is a distributed uh, message bus. But Kafka is persistent, so Kafka bus it, it doesn't lose the messages. And each one of the clients of the Kafka bus, they always receive the messages in the same order. So Kafka is very interesting for this kind of integration because it's persistent and it's ordered. Okay, And each one of the clients, it can consume the messages on its own pace. That's why everybody's talking about Kafka these days. And here I have a MySQL database server. Okay, here I have a MySQL terminal. I have Debezium running on this terminal, and I have here uh, a Debezium watcher, a Kafka watcher, which just shows the messages that are being propagated on the Kafka bus. So what I want to show you here is that using inventory, okay, and show tables. So yeah, I think you can see here, I have four uh, records here, and I'm going to issue like an update statement. I'm going to change the main from N to MAHI. And now, if I select the customers, you can see the information, the ID 1004 is MAHI. If I go here to my bus, you can check that. And now Debezium propagated a new message to the bus. And this message, if I want to format that for you to see what kind of information Debezium is propagating for that, uh, you have Debezium propagates the previous schema and the, the current schema, just in case it was an outer table statement. And the, but the cool thing about Debezium, it shows that the, 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 on the payload of the message, shows that the data before this, this statement was N, as you can check that. But after the operation, it was N mahi, okay? And then the operation was an update statement, right? I think I'm running, uh, and you can see, if I consume this JSON message in my, in my clients, it's very easy for me to create a CQRS data store. Even uh, if I want to decide to propagate all of the information from the customer in my CQRS data store, it doesn't need that. It just need the customer name, ID, and phone number. I just need to store this information in my customer database, in my CQRS database. I don't need to store all of the information. So I, I think you can imagine how can we use this information to create my CQRS data stores. Okay, and I have all the information, and people ask me, well, what happens if the Debezium goes offline and people are still issuing requests to that? Debezium reads from the MySQL transaction log, so even if the Debezium goes down, it writes on Zookeeper the, the position where it uh, stopped. So when you, even if the Debezium goes down, it goes back again, it knows where it stopped and then start broadcasting the messages after, it, uh, after the event that it has stopped. So it, it works very beautifully. I don't have time to show you today. And that's the kind of things that I wanted to show you today. Just in case you're interested for that, we share a lot of <coughs> like books like the, the mind, uh, uh, my book that I just uh, released. Uh, we have lots of blogs, content, and free software for you. Uh, if you join developers.redhat.com, I would love your feedback on the session. Just in case you follow me, the easiest way to reach me out is at my Twitter, at Yanaga. And thank you very much.